Well, well, good evening, everyone. It's just gone 7.30, so let's make a start. And let me begin by giving you the warmest of welcomes to our webinar this evening. Uh, my name, as many of you will know, is Phil Dunn, and I'm the EMF representative for Northern Ireland. And as usual, I'll be hosting this event. And it is great to have each and every one of you join us. As a mission, we are so thankful to God for friends like you who share our passion for the glory of Christ among the nations of Europe. And we've been praying that tonight will serve to deepen our understanding, stir our affections and expand our vision for the great gospel needs within our continent. Now, our topic this evening is, I think, incredibly interesting. And truthfully, I know it's not one that I know enough about. We're going to be focusing in on Eastern Orthodoxy. So what is this strange ancient religion all about? What do people with an Eastern Orthodox background actually believe? Where do their beliefs differ from ours? And how can we as evangelicals engage with them? Well, to help us answer these and many other crucial questions, we've invited our guest speaker, Iotis Kantartsis. Now, Iotis is a leading light for the gospel within his homeland of Greece. He is the pastor of the first Greek evangelical church in Athens, which is, by the way, the oldest Protestant congregation in the country. Alongside that, he is visiting professor at the Greek Bible College, coordinator of City to City Balkans, and director of the Institute for the Study of Eastern Orthodox Christianity. So suffice to say, friends, we have the perfect person to help us with this challenging theme. In fact, he has recently published a little book entitled A Christian's Pocket Guide to Eastern Orthodox Theology. And we'll highlight this helpful resource a little bit later. Yotis, we are so grateful that you've agreed to join us this evening uh, to share your knowledge, your experiences, and indeed your heart for the Eastern Orthodox world. You are most welcome. You are among friends. And we are really looking forward to what you're going to share with us. Now, the format this evening is really very simple. After we open in prayer, I'm going to hand straight over to Yotis, and he's going to share with us for around 30 minutes or so. Then we're going to move into a short Q&A session. And as ever, we want you to be involved. We want you to engage, ask questions, probe deeper, perhaps share your own experiences and so on. So take full advantage of the opportunity to engage with the artists. Now, you'll know by now that the process for asking questions is dead easy. Have a little look at the slide coming up here. If you are on a PC, just click on the chat icon and type, type in your question and send it off to Martin Tatham. Now, you'll see Martin's name at the top of the list. And it is very similar if you're on a tablet or a smartphone. The one slight difference being that you need to click on more, then chat, and again, get your question off to Martin. Martin will then collate all the questions and we will put them to Yotis after his talk. So a really simple, really straightforward process. But notice, as ever, you can send in your questions to Martin at any time. So we'd encourage you, don't wait until the Q&A session. We'd love to have as many questions as possible before then. So get involved and get your questions off to Martin, and I'm sure we'll have a really profitable Q&A time. Well, before we go any further this evening, we're going to pause and seek God's help. And I'm going to ask one of our own Greek missionaries, Leonidas Colorus, to open our time in prayers. So thank you, Leonidas. Lord God of eternity, we come into your presence at this very moment to turn our thoughts and our minds to your own greatness, 
as the creator of the heavens and the earth. We thank you that you have revealed your glory throughout this universe, but we also praise you that you have revealed your glory in the truth you have manifested to this fallen world. And we have come, Lord, to this meeting in order to have a greater understanding of your truth, that we may inform our minds, and in addition to that, that we may see our hearts being warmed by the truth of the gospel, by eternal truth, which you have displayed in the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you that you have shown to us what the truth is in Christ. And we pray, Lord, not only for our minds to be enlightened, but we also pray that our hearts may be stirred, that we may have a greater appreciation of the truth, for our desire is to see your truth being disseminated throughout the world. We ask, Lord, that you will stir our minds and our hearts, that we may have as a result of this meeting a greater zeal to share the truth with people who live in darkness. We ask for your blessing at this hour. We are dependent on you. Bless us, Lord, we pray, in the name of Jesus, Lord, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you so much, Leonidas. Uh, so, Yotis, it's time for me to finish and for you to start. So I'm going to hand straight over to you now, brother. Please do share with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting me to... Uh, participate in your fellowship. You need to excuse my uh, Greek pronunciation. Leonidas is doing way much better. He got married to a British lady that uh, explains it. Um, and also, you know, Philip, after your introduction, I am, I'm a little bit scared so that you haven't really raised the expectations too high. Uh, but what we are going to do is that we're going to do to have a very basic introduction to uh, Eastern Orthodoxy. I think we all realize that it's impossible to really grasp the depth of a very ancient tradition uh, in just half an hour. So hopefully uh, we will focus on some basic aspects of it. And then during the Q&A time, we'll be able to really focus on what may be of interest uh, to you. Now, let me share my screen. Uh, I hope you can all see it. Uh, just by looking this, uh, you know, picture, we, uh, you know, many questions and eyebrows are raised. Uh, so we'll talk, um, about Eastern Orthodoxy and what we are trying to do here is to combine two things. First of all, understand the theology, the basic theology of Eastern Orthodoxy, but also we will approach it not only from a theological standpoint, but also from a missiological standpoint. That is why it is important to understand it. Is it simply a theological question or is it important for missiological reasons? And then how do we engage? I mean, the topic uh, of tonight is not simply to understand, but to engage, even in the act of weakness. So I think it is important to uh, give some basic information at the beginning in terms of the demographics, so to say, and something which I think is uh, uh, quite interesting, especially for people who associate with an organization called European Missionary Fellowship, is to understand that Eastern Orthodoxy is a primarily European phenomenon, unlike other uh, expressions of Christianity, which are spread out in many different parts of the world. When we're talking about Eastern Orthodoxy, we're talking primarily about Eastern Europe. 
So we're talking about the primarily European phenomenon. So you can see the numbers there that one out of four Catholics, only one out of four Catholics live in Europe, only one out of eight Protestants live in Europe, but four out of five Orthodox live in Europe. Okay, so uh, uh, it's something that uh, may and need to be uh, of interest to us. Now, so that uh, in order to locate uh, Eastern Orthodoxy, uh, even though I need to tell you that um, what I'm saying right now can be a little bit misleading because the influence of Eastern Orthodoxy does not, uh, is not contained only in the countries which are Eastern Orthodox majority. But uh, I mean, I bet that many people even in Great Britain uh, may be influenced one way or another uh, from uh, Eastern Orthodox. But let's see the geography now. So you can see percentage wise, which are uh, what we call the Orthodox majority world, Moldova, Romania, Greece, Georgia, Armenia, Serbia, Bulgaria, Ukraine, Montenegro, Cyprus, Russia, Belarus, North Macedonia, we need to correct that as Greeks, and uh, Eritrea. Now, uh, this next slide is very interesting because, I mean, focus on the, um, uh, okay, uh, this is not percentages, but the actual numbers, okay, of Orthodox uh, believers in various countries. And here we have a surprise because if you notice in 2010, uh, uh, two in the top 10 Orthodox countries are not in Europe, uh, is Ethiopia and Egypt, which is very interesting because it helps us see also the missiological significance, which is primarily European, but also it goes beyond Europe. So uh, for these and other reasons, uh, it's very important to uh, really engage in an intelligent way and, and in an informed way to Eastern Orthodoxy. So there are many ways to approach Eastern Orthodoxy, but since our primary topic would be evangelism and witness, I think that uh, it would be best to focus on this question. So then how are we saved? Uh, uh, so this is perhaps the key uh, question. Now, let me rephrase this question. And actually, I'm going to do it uh, using the uh, a, a quotation coming from uh, the book that you can see in your screens. Uh, uh, this is the book, The Orthodox Church by uh, Timothy Ware, or he's also well known as Callistos, Metropolitan Callistos Ware, who is a, a, a he coming from Great Britain. He was a professor in Oxford. He's a British Orthodox. And this is perhaps one of the most famous books uh, on Eastern Orthodoxy. It is written for, West, for a Western audience, okay? Uh, so most people who are not Orthodox, this is so, so, sort of like an entry point book so that they can understand Eastern Orthodox. So he rephrases this question. I mean, what we will ask and say, how are we saved? He says, if someone asks, how can I become God? Uh, and he replies, the answer is very simple. I still remember the first time I read this phrase and I said, what? <laughs> uh, how can I become God? Is that a question? And the answer is very simple. But uh, let's continue. So he continues and he explains, saying such according to the uh, 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 such according to the teaching of the Orthodox Church is the goal at which every Christian must aim to become God, to attain theosis, deification, or divinization. Now, I know that all of these expressions, deification. Theosis, divinization, they sound really weird, if not offensive to our evangelical ears. But this is the language that Eastern Orthodox use and talk when they think about salvation. So I think it is important to go back and, and um, examine the presuppositions. Okay, how do we get to that point? And what do we mean 
by those terms. Now, when we talk about uh, salvation, uh, uh, so the question uh, uh, should be, where do we start? And most Protestants, or I should say us Protestants, most of the times when we think of the gospel and the need for salvation, we go back to the fall. So we need to be saved because something happened in the past and that is the fall, the original sin, and you know we need to be saved from that, okay? Now, interestingly enough, the Orthodox start the story earlier on. Actually, in a way, they start where the Bible starts, and that is with the creation. So uh, uh, when you think, or when they think about the creation, they make a very important distinction. Uh, it's very important for their theological understanding. Uh, I'm not saying that is uh, scripturally and exegetically sound, but what they do is that they make a very basic distinction between image being created according to God's image and being created according to his likeness. So they make this distinction saying that the image is something like a gift, is who we are, what constitutes humanity. And they will explain that part of what it means to be in the image of God uh, is to have rationality, of course, uh, and some other faculties, but most importantly, to have freedom which is very uh, interesting because what is the main essence of God, what means for God to become is to be totally free. So in a way, uh, 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 being God's image means that we are uh, free agents and you know we have rationality and all these other capacities. Now, that is what we have, but also there is this uh, other aspect of our creation, which is that we are created according to God's likeness. Now, that is not who we are, but uh, this is the goal to which we need to attain. That is what we have to become. So there is something that we are and something that we have to become. Let's see it uh, in uh, Callistus, uh, Callistus, uh, uh, way of expressing it. According to most of the Greek fathers, the terms image and likeness do not mean exactly the same thing. Of course, as I said, exegetically, that is challenged, you know, because uh, uh, the exegesis of Genesis shows that these are interchangeable terms. But anyway, uh, that, that is another topic. I mean, how do we do theology? Uh, and we do theology, of course, with the sola scriptura, with only the Bible, based on the Bible, but this is not the way that uh, Orthodox would approach the, the, the act of theology, but that's a totally other subject. I'm not, we're not going to open it. Now, he explained that the expression according to the image, as John of Damascus indicate, indicates rationality and freedom, as we talked about it, while the expression according to the likeness indicates assimilation to God, uh, being united to God, assimilation to God through virtue. To acquire the likeness is to be deified. It is to become a second God, a God by grace. And uh, again, there is a quotation from the book of Psalms. Now, in order to understand that, it's important to keep in mind this uh, kind of graph there. Uh, the, for the Orthodox, uh, there are uh, two stages when we think about salvation. Uh, so we are created, and by our creation, uh, we need to attain something. So um, the, the question is not how can we be saved, but the question is how can we become deified? Because from our constitution, there is this call to become deified, okay? So creation, deification. Uh, creation, in a way, we will say is uh, that we are, by our creation, the image of God. And by our attainment of deification, we will uh, become uh, according to the likeness of God, so to say. Okay, so there are these two stages. Uh, and, and so in, in a way, uh, what is missing there? Uh, uh, the fall, okay? So you don't really need the fall 
in order to start talking about the need to become deified because that you have it already from your creation. So what, what happened at the fall? What happened at the fall? Um, the fall, it's, it's a hiccup. I don't know if Americans use this expression or if you British use it. It's, it's, it's like stumbling. It's not really falling from a position but it's not attaining, it's like a desertion. It's like not attaining your purpose, not fulfilling your uh, destiny, so to say. Um, and, and of course, because of, of Adam uh, uh, wanting to become like God, not by grace, but through uh, what the devil offered him, okay? Uh, something bad happened. Uh, and what is that? Uh, uh, death entered and mortality and corruption of nature entered in our uh, reality, okay? Now, uh, it's very important to keep in mind that for the orthodox understanding of the fall or what we call original sin, there is no notion of guilt, of transgression, of punishment, of God's wrath, any of that. So uh, we, we can talk more about that if you raise questions, but we're not going to get into much depth. But what happens is uh, there is this sort of separation uh, and death and mortality enters into our, uh, uh, into our nature and corruption, okay? So what we need is someone who will get us back on track someone who will take our humanity and, and they fight again. And, and, and who is that? Jesus Christ. And when does that happen? Primarily with the incarnation. So when Christ, uh, when God, the Son, becomes uh, incarnate, what do we have? We have, uh, you know, he, he accomplishes what we were supposed by our creation to accomplish. He unites human nature with divine nature, okay? So in, in a way, the incarnation is the key, one of the key uh, soteriological uh, contributions, so to say, of Jesus Christ. Now, keep in mind that there is a very simple uh, linguistic uh, 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 this, uh, difference in terminology, which makes a huge difference in theology. So where we talk about original sin, the Orthodox, they don't use this term. The term that they use translates into ancestral sin. So there is it's, it's the sin of Adam and Eve, is their guilt, is their problem. What we inherit is corruption and death. And what we need to be saved from is not from any sense of guilt or uh, uh, you know, uh, no, no notion of propitiation, penal substitution of any of that sort. We don't have to be justified in that sense. But what we need is we need someone to really, uh, so to say, purify our nature from corruption and primarily uh, 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 get victory over death. And of course, you have that with the incarnation, you have that with the resurrection. Now, that's the orthodox story. Uh, but we believe that the Bible tells us a better story. Uh, and uh, a better story does not be begin with the fall. I need to say that uh, many times as evangelicals, we make this mistake. We, we start with the fall. We start with the bad news, okay? Uh, neither should uh, the story start with the creation, even though this is something that we need to hear when we discuss with the Orthodox. I think that's also important because that situates uh, the redemptive story within the broader context uh, of God's creative purposes and his purposes for, for his creation and whatnot. But I would suggest that a better story should start with the cross, with the cross. Um, I'll, I mean, so the, the way to understand uh, salvation, the way to, the way to understand uh, what happened in the Garden of Eden, the way to understand sin and original sin is 
through the lenses, the lens of the cross. Now, uh, let me just read one more uh, short quotation here. Uh, it comes from a book that deals with Saint Augustine, and uh, we share a, 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 an August, Augustinian, uh, so to say, heritage as Reformed believers and also other traditions, not the Orthodox. For most Eastern Orthodox, Augustine is the bad guy of the church history who, uh, you know, led us in very problematic, uh, uh, you know, locations and, and, and wrote. But uh, here is, is a quotation from the book In Adam's Fall by Ian McFarlane. Sin is knowable in its death precisely as original sin, only as it is, has been forgiven. And that's only after the Christian gospel of forgiveness has been proclaimed and believed it is a concept internal to the logic of the faith and not an apologetic lever that can be used to render that faith somehow more relevant or credible. Uh, that is that we need to see the cross and then we need to, to ask the question, okay, why did the cross was, why was the cross necessary? Why, uh, uh, God's son had to die in such a particular way, that particular kind of death. And through that, we can then unravel uh, the story of salvation. Uh, so we read in the book of Hebrews, chapter two, verses 14 to 17, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things. Here we have incarnation that through death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. Okay, so Christ's death on the cross uh, fulfilled the purpose of conquering death, which is the result of, of our sinfulness and deliver. So we need the deliverance and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Now, for surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Now we have covenant language here, okay? We, uh, we are enriched with more uh, 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 reality uh, here. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people, okay? So you realize that through the cross, we gain a different understanding of what happened. And I suggest that there is not the two stages, but the three stages uh, scheme where we have creation. Uh, then we have the fall, which is a real fall. There is a real problem there. And the fall entails death, corruption, of course, but also entails um, transgression, guilt, uh, uh, things that have to be atoned. Uh, and then of course, we have Christ's work and through that we have the third stage, which is redemption. And of course you may ask, as I try to conclude, uh, so what, I mean, why is that important? Why this distinction is important? I will only highlight a couple of points. First of all, this difference explains uh, two totally different ways of understanding salvation. In the Eastern Orthodox world, there is what we are calling a synergistic understanding of salvation. So God provide something, but you also have to try. You have also to, 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 to do something, okay? So it's both God's work and your, your work. Why? Because I hope you remember the two, there is, there is like this ongoing line that takes you to deification. And of course, who is climbing that line? You do it. Of course, God is helping you. We can talk more about how, but you need to you need to climb that 
you know, slope in order to understand, to, to, to go up there. But uh, uh, in our understanding, uh, it's very important to, to see these three stages because there you see that uh, the fall is our work, but redemption is Christ's work. So there is nothing we can do to get out of our fallen position, okay? Uh, so Christ didn't come to offer some help for us uh, so that then we can go back to back on track and try again. So uh, uh, this uh, difference, I think, uh, helps us see the difference, uh, uh, the result, it results to, to, to diff totally different ways of understanding uh, salvation. So one is synergistic, the other is based on grace. The other main difference, which is very practical, is that uh, in the first understanding, the two stages, salvation is always a process. You are being saved. There is no point in your earthly life that you can know for sure. On the other hand, uh, when we have this other understanding of salvation, uh, you know, the, the, the most important blessing that comes out of it is the blessing of assurance. And now that, uh, uh, that is true for all Protestants across the spectrum, even for those who don't believe in the, in the safety, in the, uh, the, the, the uh, security of salvation, at least they say that if, if you ask me today, they'll say, yes, I'm a child of God, I'll go to heaven. For the Orthodox, even that uh, is not allowed, is not part of their experience. And I think that is a very uh, important, um, how can I say, practical result of this difference. So there is a very important, so what? Uh, the main prayer of an Orthodox is the so-called Jesus prayer. Monks, I don't know if you can see that picture, he has what is called Komboskini, which is like prayer beads that, you know, they pray again and again, and again, sometimes thousands of times a, a day. And what is that prayer? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now, is that a good prayer? It is. But imagine if that is your only prayer. And imagine if there is no point that you say that we have received mercy, as Paul proclaims. And uh, we are sinners, but we are justified sinners. So uh, as we conclude, oops, let me, uh, as, as we conclude, uh, I would say that one of the blessings that we enjoy and sometimes we don't appreciate is this close, intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ and this sense of assurance that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior and this assurance that God is our Father and this experience of intimacy. So uh, whenever we give uh, our witness to Eastern Orthodox, uh, I think it's very important to um, emphasize that. Of course, this is the gospel is not about our own experience. It's about a story, a better story. But uh, I think that uh, starting from our experience, from the experience that this better story produces, I think it's a very powerful tool, so to say, an entry point in our conversations. So I will conclude here and uh, uh, I do hope and I'm sure that many more things will come through the questions that you will raise. So as we say in Greece, I'm full uh, ears, full of ears to hear your questions. Well, thank you so much, Iotis. That was uh, very clear, very engaging, and very enlightening. Uh, but I do know that you've been very selective in what you've shared with us, and there's so much more yeah. we could explore and perhaps even dig in a little bit deeper to some of the things you've already mentioned. 
and no doubt our listeners will have plenty of follow-up questions they'd like to ask. And the good news is we've got about 20 minutes or so for Q&A. Uh, so if you've got a question and you haven't popped it in yet, please get your skates on. Uh, remember, just click on the chat icon, type in your question and send it off to Martin. Uh, that'll be near the top of the list. So Martin, I'm hoping we've got a few good questions all ready to go. Would you like to select one to, to get us started, please? Well, actually, we've got a, a large number of questions, so it's going to be quite, you know, we, um, uh, we're going to be quite, 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 quite a challenge fitting them all in. What I'll try and do is group them together, uh, maybe start with a few of the simpler ones just to help us build up a bit more of our understanding. And thanks very much, Otis, for your talk. That was very enlightening. But uh, we've got lots of different areas that we want to explore. Maybe I'll try and start with some sim simpler ones. Um, uh, perhaps the most basic one, um, and Andrew asked this, Andrew Birch, um, would, you, would you say that, generally speaking, Eastern Orthodox people need the gospel? And if so, why? Perhaps the most basic question of all, but um, yeah. Yes, uh, I would say so. I would say so. Uh, I, you know, there are many different ways of approaching this uh, question, and I'm not going to um, um, uh, get into them because I think it's very important to have a clear understanding as to, uh, you know, a broader understanding of Eastern Orthodox in order to make, you know, some very grand judgments as, you know, as to whether they are Christians or not. Of course, you realize that we share, uh, you know, many, many, many very important aspects of our Christian faith together, uh, but they do need the gospel uh, because they need this, this story, <laughs> as we described it, the, the, the story of the, with the centrality of the cross and that, that gives us this sense of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That is, I would say, that they're missing and definitely uh, yes, they need to, to share, we need to share the gospel. Now, as with anybody, we need to share the gospel uh, 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 respectfully. Uh, uh, not, I mean, not, not um, uh, I mean, Callistos Ware describes, he has written actually another book uh, with the title, How Are We Saved? And he describes uh, this uh, incident when he's on a train or something and somebody approaches him and, you know, he's a bishop, you know, wearing all this clothing and whatnot. And he approaches him and says, you know, uh, are you saved? He asked this question. Uh, we, we need to, to understand that uh, perhaps we need to use a different language to engage uh, so that people will understand what do we mean by that. Okay, so, but I would say, you know, I'll give a simple answer to this simple question, which is not that simple. Uh, the answer is yes. Thank you. Thank you, Yotis. Great question to begin with. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. Martin, back over to you. Yeah, again. so maybe just building on that, um, could you just summarize how would somebody, how would an Eastern Orthodox person, what would they consider the cross to be about? You, you mentioned trying to start with the cross and explaining the mechanism of the cross. But how would somebody from Eastern Orthodoxy or Greek Orthodoxy, how would they understand the cross? Why was the cross necessary? Yeah. And why in that, that, uh, that mode of, of Christ's death? Yeah, uh, that's, that's a great question. And, and talking again about, um, speaking again about um, sharing the gospel, I would say that this is something which is very central. And actually, this is what the New Testament is telling us, right? to, uh, not to know anybody else, but Christ in whom him crucified. Uh, and to, to be honest, uh, for most Orthodox, uh, when they think of the cross, they don't really think much about the theological significance of the cross. Uh, what they feel when they see the cross is this mystery. How is it possible God himself who created everything to be in such a humble state and suffer all these sufferings for us? They feel sorry and pity, I should say, looking uh, at the cross. But um, they... Is, is not, unfortunately, is not the most important aspect of Christ's work. 
which I think goes contrary to the testimony of the New Testament. So I was reading the other day a, a, a book by a young Greek Orthodox theologian who's a good friend of mine and he, does, he has written a book and he has a whole chapter on deification. I mean, many, 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 many pages. And I wrote back to him and I said, listen, I mean, I'm really surprised and i astounded that in like in a, in a long, long chapter on deification, you haven't put the Bible even not even once, and you haven't mentioned the cross of Jesus Christ not even once. Mm -hmm. and, and that I think is problematic. And, and I think it's very important in, in our witness with the Eastern Orthodox to really uh, help them. I mean, of course, we need to, in order to be fair, we need to admit that most of the times we don't know exactly what to do with the doctrine of incarnation ourselves as Protestants, or even we don't really delve into the depths of the theological significance of the resurrection so much. So mostly it's like an apologetic topic for us, whether historically happened or not, but without really understanding what exactly is the significance of it. But I would say that yes, for the Orthodox, it's very important to really focus on the cross and take into account the biblical testimony and witness as to what exactly is the significance of that event. Mm. Long answer, no, sorry, I'll try to be very sorry. helpful, uh, very important answer, I think, a very important question to, to tackle. Okay, Martin, back over to you again. Yeah, again, I'll, I'll try and group a few questions together, but we'll, maybe I can use one from Ian Maria to ask about scripture. So in the light of views about the nature of humanity and salvation, what's, what's the mainstream Eastern Orthodox doctrine of scripture? Could you, could you um, give us some insight into that, uh, Yotis? Yeah, let me, thank you. This is a good question. Um, I, I, I like the way it's phrased when it says the mainstream, because we need to understand that as we have our different streams and traditions in Protestantism, uh, same thing happens in Eastern Orthodoxy. So it's not like a unified uh, hall where everybody believes exactly the same. So there are many, many differences there as well. Now, as far as the scriptures, uh, I mean, a, a very important thing to keep in mind in general is that the Orthodox are not Catholic. I used to say that all the time. The, the Eastern Orthodox are not Roman Catholic. Many times uh, for us Protestants, we, because, you know, they chant, and you know there were these funny clothes and whatnot. We group them together and we approach them as one. They are not. And why I'm saying that in the Catholic tradition is, I mean, there is this dogma, this doctrine about scripture and tradition as two co-equal sources of revelation. Uh, that is not the is not formulated the same way in the Orthodox mindset. For the Orthodox to simplify things, uh, the number one, the key notion entity is the church. So the church is really even beyond scripture and tradition. So the church uh, uh, contains God's revelation in a mystical way, so to say. And whenever is needed, <laughs> the church expresses that through different testimonies. One is the scripture. Another one may be the writings of some fathers. Uh, another one may be the liturgy. So for example, uh, uh, most of the theology about uh, Virgin Mary, uh, most of the Eastern Orthodox Mariology comes from the liturgy, not from uh, doctrinal texts or, you know, it's just, you know, they believe what they believe because, you know, it's uh, the, the Lex Orandi before the Lex Credendi, as they said, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the worship, the prayer that then uh, formulates their belief. Uh, it, it may be even an icon, uh, part of God's revelation. So they, they have a totally different uh, approach to uh, revelation. And, and you realize that uh, I, you know, always say that where I mean, I remember my sermon yesterday where I was focusing on one word and doing all the grammatical analysis and explaining that this word does not mean this, but it means that it doesn't go with that word, but it refers to the other word and, you know, all these arguments. 
you realize that for most Orthodox, this is totally irrelevant. For example, for, you know, there is still debate as to what is the canon of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's one of these open questions. I mean, we may fight with, you know, about this little word and they can live with the idea that, okay, what, what, what exactly are the books? Because it doesn't matter at the end of the day, the church in an in, intuitive, intuitive way knows. Uh, so Thank you, Yoris. That's, again, that's really enlightening. Um, thank you, Martin. I know we've got quite a number of questions still to get through, so let's keep going. Over to you. Yeah, so, and, and I'm trying to keep pace with all the questions coming in. So it's some really interesting questions. Again, let me try and group a couple of ones. Yoris, maybe we can go back to the whole question of creation, because that's raised a few questions. Maybe I can put two sides questions from both sides. Michael Robinson you know, asked about the, the, the idea of creation and the need of deification and, and implied, does that not imply an imperfect creation if there was a need for deification? Maybe I'll leave that one with you, ask that one, then I'll come to the opposite side, but maybe could you address that yeah. one? Is that, does that imply an imperfect creation? That, that's, that's a very good question and it depends on how, um, um, how offensive you're going to be. So, for example, definitely you can see something platonic there. Uh, that creation in a way is for. Definitely you can see that in even some Greek Orthodox theologians. That uh, so God creates you something uh, in order to become something else. Uh, so that, that implies that uh, creation is. Um, so to say, it sets the problem, so to say, or sets the scene. Um, now, of course, most of the would not like to, you know, be labeled as platonic or neoplatonic, and, you know, they, they are most probably right. Uh, but yes, definitely, they will uh, resist and, and reject uh, the idea that again comes from Augustine about the perfection. Of, of uh, creation in the sense that, um, um, you know, we have been created in a perfect state and then you realize sin, sin comes and we fall from. So that's why we talk about fall, falling from the perfect state. Now, uh, uh, the way that most Orthodox would uh, prefer to describe uh, what they mean is to use the, the word uh, uh, dynamism. Di so there is, the, uh, creation is dynamic by its nature. So uh, it is not static, uh, static or whatever you, you know, sorry for the pronunciation, I hope you understand. So it's not so much imperfection that uh, needs perfection, but uh, there is a call, a sense of a call. Which, is, which imply, is implied in the very uh, constitution of our creation. Okay, now uh, that uh, is true, there is a call, but the question is, uh, uh, what is our calling? So, I mean, if, if we read the book of Genesis, definitely there is a call, but is the call to become like God? Is, is the, uh, an exact, of course, a huge other question, which we don't, you know, unless somebody asks it, we don't have, what do we mean by deification? So, uh, I, I mean, there are many different ways of understanding it. I hope that clarifies. So it's not necessarily imperfection, though uh, some Orthodox theologians, they talk about creation in such, in such a way that implies that, but for, the, for most, uh, it has to do with this kind of calling and dynamism. So there's this dynamic sense of creation. Mm -hmm. Thank you again, Yotis. Back to you, Martin, then. Mm, yeah, so maybe I can just ask, come, come at the same question or a similar question from a slightly different angle. If you, I think you mentioned that there's no aspect of guilt in the fall, at least guilt mm. uh, other than for Adam and Eve. Is there, for, for a Greek Orthodox person, is there any sense there is a need of forgiveness? Is there any sense of guilt and the need of God's forgiveness? Um, yeah. Uh, and if so, um, if not, then how would you approach the whole question of the, you know, the need for salvation with somebody from a Greek Orthodox background? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, that, that's again a very good question. Is all the questions that came in? Um, it, it's complicated. I will answer. Saying, I mean, do they need? Do they feel the need for uh, for forgiveness? Well, uh, I many times answered, uh, you know, with the Jesus prayer, which I just mentioned. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Okay, so what what is what is that? Now, um, it's, it's very important to, to uh, again, understand their story, okay? I'm not saying that, that this is uh, definitely is not the biblical story, but definitely is their story. Their story is this. Adam and Eve are put in the with this, uh, um, this call to be not. So you're totally underdeveloped, you're immature. So uh, Adam and Eve, in some ways, they're like two immature uh, children put in the garden. And, you know, we know that children do from time to time foolish things, especially if they have bad influences, right? So imagine that you say to your son or daughter, let's say son, because of the example will uh, fit more uh, with that, you know, don't go out, you know, he wants to go out to play soccer. And you say, don't go out to play soccer because it's raining, it's cold, you will get a cold and you will get pneumonia. And he won't listen to you. And you say, don't do it, don't do it. And uh, at the end, you know, a, a, a bad friend comes from outside and he says, hey, come, let's play football. And he goes out and they play soccer and he comes back and you know, guess what? He gets a cold, he has high fever, 40 Celsius, he gets pneumonia, uh, you know, and you take him to the hospital. Or let me say, what do you do as a parent? You get upset a little bit, but I mean, what kind of a father you are? If you say, you know, no, you need, I'll, you know, I'll punish you, you need to suffer for that. And, you know, you are a father after all, you feel sorry for your child. And of course, why did he get fever? Is it your punishment? No, no, you warned him about it, but it's the natural result of his disobedience, okay? So what do you do as a father, seeing your child suffering from the natural results, especially if you take into account that he is an immature child and he was fooled by a very uh, evil friend, uh, you realize that there was, there has been some injustice to him. So as a father, you need to make things right to justify your child, meaning you need to take him out of his misery, try to do something to solve his problem. And what is his problem? His disobedience, uh, uh, you know, this is the cause of his problem, but that's not his problem. His main problem is his sickness, his fever. So you need to do something about that. So uh, if you try to put theological terms to this story, I hope you realize what is the, the, the you know, the mindset, the story. So it's, it's very difficult, I would say, to share the gospel starting and saying, uh, you know, uh, Christ was on, on the cross and he took on him the punishment, the, the, the right, the, the just punishment of our sins. That will scare them away and it would not mean much. Uh, so I say that uh, these biblical uh, ideas and notions, we need to translate them and, and help them go there using a different road. I hope it helps. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it answers exactly the question, but, uh, and actually this story I just told you, you can find in Irenaeus uh, of Lyon, that's how he, exp he, he understands Adam. And it's a very philanthropic uh, approach, okay? And very generous approach, but that's, that's you know, so mm -hmm. they accuse us Protestants and in general Westerners that they have, they're very guilty. They have this guilt ridden conscience and they see God as a wrathful God who cannot uh, please himself and, He's always upset with things. So uh, we need not to, uh, you know, uh, 
we need to preach mm. the gospel, which is good news. All Thank right? you, Yotis. Yeah, very, very helpful. Time has gone, but we're going to try and squeeze in uh, one more, which is going to group a couple of questions together. Um, Martin, back again to you. We'll try and get another one in. Yeah, I don't want to. Um, we've got a number of questions, but um, maybe I think there's a number of questions about Greek Orthodoxy versus. Russian Orthodoxy. I think maybe we need to leave that to the breakout groups because I think that's probably a whole topic in its own right. But can we, maybe we could just focus a bit on how do we engage and share the gospel with people from Eastern Orthodox background? Maybe I can just quote uh, Paul Bozzasi on the on the on, well, he actually sent sent on the chat to everyone, but maybe just read that out. His own experience with Eastern Orthodox Church in Romania is this: no Orthodox believer has has a personal and direct relationship with with God via Christ, but only through the priests of the church. Consequently, our testimony is about already enjoying a personal relationship with Jesus uh, without the help of a pastor or a priest. So uh, I think you can probably everyone can see, see that comment. But maybe I can then come on and group a, a few questions already about um, engaging with people um, from an Eastern Orthodox background. So Benjamin Smith was, uh, is asking, um, what text of the Bible would you point people at, or which area of the Bible? Maybe I can also, uh, Benjamin perhaps also said, what, um, how would you share, um, uh, how would you share our understanding of salvation with somebody from an Eastern Orthodox background? And Andrew Birch also was asking, what subject should we prioritize? So I think it's all along the lines of, how would you share the gospel with somebody from an Eastern Orthodox background? So maybe, maybe you can group a few of those together, Yossis. Yeah, Thank you, thank you, Martin. You're doing an amazing job trying to, you know, um, to, to put all these questions together and group them. And, and let me say again, let's start by saying that our brother Paul, you know, from Romania, that's totally right. That's exactly what you know I, I said, and I totally believe that is is very important when we give our witness to uh, Orthodox people to really share. Uh, and I said. And I believe that this is not the gospel, okay? So we don't have to confuse that. The gospel is not our story, but it's God's uh, story. But I think it's very important to whet the appetite, so to say, or to, to, to make them ask and wonder about, you know, what story produces that kind of story, our story. It's, it's very important to start and emphasize that, the personal relationship with Jesus. Um, and, and, and that is something that, most most uh, Orthodox people are missing, unfortunately. That's why they need the gospel, because they're missing a very important aspect of what you know Christianity is all about. Um, and uh, so, uh, definitely, it's through the priests. Uh, definitely, is through this whole movement, which is uh, very prominent in the Orthodox world about monks. Uh, or you know, start started as they call them in in Slavic um, contexts. You know, these uh, holy monks who have attained this sort of deification and whatnot. So, but most people they lack a, a personal experience. So, I, I think that is very important. Now, uh, to to answer all the other questions, try to 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 give like a comprehensive answer. My favorite. A text from the Bible is the parable of the prodigal son. I use that all the time when I give my witness to Eastern Orthodox people. Why? First of all, uh, it's Eastern is not Western. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's the son who betrays his father. I mean, people in our part of the world, we hate that and we you know, we shame on our cultures and we, we understand that language. So it's not really breaking a commandment or breaking a rule, but it's um, shaming the father, okay? And uh, I, I use this uh, story. The other thing is the story and we like stories. So many times, especially in the West, there is a, a linear uh, cerebral kind of approach in setting the gospel. So the four spiritual laws, for example, that used to be quite popular like many decades ago. Uh, what is, you know, is like first law, okay, do you understand it? Okay, then we go to the second law. Do you accept it? Then, you know, uh, 
this is not the way we operate. And so uh, the, the, the important thing about there, uh, this parable is uh, for me, the key to, uh, okay, the son returns. And uh, in his mind, he says, okay, let me make me as one of your workers. Okay. Let me prove, let me, this is the process. Okay. Let me now give me one more opportunity. So for most Orthodox, what happens in infant baptism is they're given one more opportunity. Adam failed, but now you have your own. This is your time. Okay. This is your chance. Let's see how you're going to do it. Uh, uh, but, but what does the father gives to the son? Does, does he give him one more opportunity uh, to, be, to be the good son? No. Uh, uh, he gives him uh, the assurance, which is he kisses. I mean, let's end with a kiss. He gives him the ring, the place in the table, the former clothing, and he kisses him which is the experience of salvation. And that is really upfront, it's not at the end of the process. It's really at the very beginning of the process. Now, we call that justification, all right? But you realize for an Orthodox is too compl- I mean, there are many other elements that are totally missing in order to understand the language of justification. Now, I'm not saying that we need to abandon this language, all right? But I think that is when you give your witness, it's very important to, to, to make it in a way that people understand it. And so I use this story. And of course, this is a different way of saying, you know, it's adopt, adoption, justification, uh, regeneration, and, and, and whatnot. So that's kind of, I hope it's, it's an answer that gives at least some uh, guidelines, so to say, or some directions, points to some directions. That's really helpful, Yodas. And what a... What a lovely story to, to end at least this part of our uh, webinar on. Um, thank you to everyone who asked such great questions and a special thank you, Yotis, for answering, for sharing, for helping us understand much better Eastern Orthodoxy. I think it's been a super evening. Uh, now, if you'd like to learn more and delve deeper into this subject, Yotis has written a very helpful little book. Here it comes. A Christian's Pocket Guide to Eastern Orthodox Theology. And you'll find it really helpful. You can get it from a variety of Christian bookshops, including 10 of those for about five pounds or so. Now, before we finish this part of our webinar, we've got a few important announcements to make. So just bear with us. I know we've overshot by, by a few minutes, but bear with us because the first of these is incredibly exciting. And it is only fitting that our mission director, Andrew Birch, should share the news. So, Andrew, it is over to you now. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Yes, well, uh, if you remember when Yotti showed us one of the first slides uh, about majority Eastern Orthodox countries, the top two on the list were Moldova and Romania, uh, with a very high percentage of Eastern Orthodox people. Well, it just so happened, so to say, uh, that at the end of April, at our last uh, executive committee meeting of EMF, we accepted three new missionaries and one in Moldova and two in Romania. So they're all working as pastors in uh, majority Eastern Orthodox countries. And we're very excited about that. So we have, uh, first of all, Mihai, Mihai Kisari, uh, there he is with his wife, Irina, and their two little daughters, uh, Delia and Elisa. And uh, Mihai is 29, and he started up a few years ago a church plant in the capital city of Moldova, which is called Chisinau, which has 650,000 people, more or less. And he's uh, pastoring a small, young church in that city, and we're excited to be supporting Mihai uh, and his wife in their ministry. And then we also accepted as missionaries uh, at that same meeting, two brothers from the uh, Transylvania region of Romania. So they're uh, Hungarian speaking, and that is uh, uh, Benjamin, who's married to Deborah, and they have a little baby girl called Priscilla. 
and uh, Tamas Moros, uh, and he is engaged to be married to Andrea in August, and they both are working as pastors of churches. In fact, they're both pastoring two or three churches uh, in the Transylvania region of Romania, and they're both just coming up to their 25th birthday. So they're both young men, uh, been to seminary, and now they're EMF missionaries. So we're really excited. Uh, Mihai in Moldova, I think, is our first ever missionary in Moldova with EMF. So that's especially exciting. But we're no less excited to have welcomed Benjamin uh, and Tamash also as EMF missionaries. So we really appreciate people's prayer for and support of uh, these young men uh, and the wives and the fiancé uh, in their ministry as we move forward together with them. Well, thank you, Andrew. Uh, isn't that so thrilling? Uh, please do pray for these uh, three brothers and indeed their wives and families. Now, just two other very brief announcements, this time about some upcoming events. Uh, firstly, regarding our webinars. Uh, we're going to press the pause button and take a little break over the summer months, uh, meaning that our next webinar is going to be held on Monday evening, the 6th of September, God willing, and that will be at our usual time of half past seven. And we're going to be fixing our focus on the gospel in the Republic of Ireland. I wonder if you knew that the Republic of Ireland has the lowest percentage of evangelicals in the English speaking world. Massive need right on our doorstep. And we're planning to have a really engaging panel discussion to explore all this. So again, please plan to join us and please let others know and encourage them to join as well. And then looking even further ahead, we thought we'd highlight what we've got in store for you. We're planning two autumn conferences. Both will be, God willing, in person rather than online. Uh, the first up is the GB conference. It's on Saturday, the 6th of November in North Preston Evangelical Church. The theme will be evangelizing in a hostile world. And along with three of our missionaries, the main speaker will be none other than Stuart Olliott, which sounds amazing. But then it's the one you've all been waiting for. It's the Northern Irish Conference. And it will be held on Saturday, the 20th of November in Stranmillis Evangelical Church. And our theme will be Know the Gospel, Share the Gospel. So please get those dates in your diary. We will, of course, get all the details on our, web, on our website, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram via email in due course. So loads to look forward to. Now, if you would like to learn more about our work and the needs and opportunities for gospel work across Europe, we've got a range of resources which we'd love to share with you. Uh, why not ask to receive our vision magazine? and newsletter. In fact, this is the latest edition of our Vision magazine, which has just been released. Hopefully you can see it there if I pop it up on the screen. There it is, lovely new copy, and it is really worth getting. It's based around the subject of the perseverance of the saints, and it spotlights a whole variety of our retired missionaries, uh, many who have labored faithfully for decades and it's bound to bless your soul. In addition to that, you can receive specific missionary prayer letters enabling you to be informed and to be prayerful. One further great way you can partner with us is by inviting us to take part in your church midweek meeting or Sunday services. Uh, thankfully for many of us, our churches are beginning to open up again, and we'd love to come and visit you and share in person. But of course, if you prefer an online meeting, we'd be more than happy to join you in that way too. We want to serve you in whatever way we can. To get in touch, just email us or simply visit our website at europeanmission.org. Now, if you need to leave in a moment, please feel free to do so. But just like our previous webinars, we do have an additional breakout session, which I think we're going to need given the number of questions we've had. That will last for about maybe 25 minutes or so. So it's a further opportunity to interact with the Otis. We'd love for you to join that. I'll explain how in just a moment, but for now, let me draw this part of our meeting to a close. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for 
helping us this evening to at least begin to understand uh, the worldview of so many of those living in Eastern Europe and in other countries. And Father, we pray that you would indeed move our hearts, fill us with compassion and with love to want to reach out to those who are lost in sin. We pray that you would move our hearts to support those at the front line of gospel work in Greece and Romania and other predominantly Eastern Orthodox countries. Father, we pray, we long that the light of the gospel would shine in these countries, that many who are in darkness would come to embrace the truth that salvation is found in Jesus Christ alone, through faith in him, trusting in his propitiatory work on our behalf. Lord, we pray now that you will part some of us with your blessing and for the rest of us, continue with us, we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, if you must leave, then thank you again for joining us. We hope you've been blessed and encouraged, and we hope you'll join us next time. But if you'd like to stay on for the breakout session, then when the little invitation button appears on your screen, just click join, and that will automatically transfer you to our breakout room. Otherwise, just click later and you can leave. So for those who must leave, thank you again. Goodbye and God bless. And for those staying on, I'll see you in a second. Thank you.